All right, we're going to start Chapter 6 of Skink No Surrender by Carl Hiasen on this gorgeous Sunday afternoon. Trent isn't a bad person, not at all. He'll do, he'd do anything for my mother, and I mean throw himself in front of a speeding train. She says it's better to be with a simple man who really cares about you than to be with some Einstein who treats you like a doormat. Still, I can't deny that I occasionally take advantage of my stepfather's, how should I say this? Intellectual limitations. When I rushed in the door after the Dodge Only incident, Trent was on the edge of the sofa glued to a documentary called Bigfoot Uncensored. Yo, Richard, sit down and watch this. It's awesome. Sorry, I'm late. Are you late? He looked at his watch. Oh, wow. The engine on the boat was running rough, so I changed out the plugs. Good job. You get something to, you get something to eat? Trent had refixed his gaze on the TV screen, where a spacey car salesman from Oregon was telling about the time he picked up a Sasquatch hitchhiking on the interstate. That, said my stepfather, would be so radical. I, to I would totally stop for a Bigfoot. Duh, yeah. I'd take him straight to the Cracker Barrel, I said. Let him order whatever he wanted off the menu. Are you being a smartass again? What's wrong with the Cracker Barrel? He said, shh, I want to hear this part. Hey, Blake and his dad are going camping in Ocala for a couple of days. They asked me to come. Mom said it's cool as long as you check it out with Blake's folks. Me check it out? She's stuck at Home Depot with Kyle and Robbie picking out new paint for their apartment. Helpfully, I dialed, then handed my cell to Trent. By now, I was losing track of all the lies I was telling. The main thing on my mind was finding Mally as fast as possible. Hi, this is Richard's stepfather, Trent said into the phone. The voice on the other end belonged to Beth, Mally's friend. She was pretending to be Blake's mother. Beth has acted in a few plays at the community theater, and she can do all kinds of voices. Impersonating a mom was easy. I had prepped her on what to say, how much Blake and his dad were really looking forward to me joining them on their trip. We're sorry for the short notice, Beth would be saying. Hey, no problem, said Trent. This is super nice of you. Now I had to get out the door quickly in case mom called the house. I packed my stuff in like three minutes flat. Toothbrush, hat, board shorts, t-shirts, underwear, my laptop, and a pocket knife. Everything went into my backpack. Then I grabbed a box of granola bars from the pantry and said goodbye to Trent. He actually pried himself away from the Bigfoot documentary long enough to stand and give me a knuckle bump. Have fun, dude, but be safe. Always, I said. The dull gray Malibu was parked in the driveway of a vacant house at the end of the block, Skink drumming his fingers on the steering wheel. He put on his shower cap, which I feared would draw more attention than the gash in his scalp. Also, he was wearing sunglasses with violet mirrored lenses. It looked to me like he'd run a comb through his beard. A good start. But dangling from a cord around his leathery neck was the rattle from a big eastern diamondback. In other words, the man was not what you'd call inconspicuous. On the way out of town, I recounted my last phone conversation with Mally. She's got to be on the same island that has a drawbridge, I said. Maybe. Hey, it's the best clue we've got. Tell me about the boat horn you heard on the phone. Maybe a tug or a shrimper? I have no idea. Skink seemed annoyed. Well, it was the pitch high or low? Pretty low. Deeper the horn, bigger the boat, he muttered. Bigger the boat, bigger the bridge. Makes sense. Check in the glove box, would you? Should be a CD. Mr. Tile had thought of everything. Skink told me to feed the disc into the slot on the car stereo. A song came on that I recognized. It was called Run Through the Jungle, kind of a deep south rocker. My father had known all the words. So this is like your personal mix? I asked the governor. Road music, son. We were heading due west, crossing the state, because the last place Mally had used her cell phone, the city of Clearwater, was on the Gulf Coast. Maybe the fake Talbo Chalk had friends on an island in that area. I asked Skink how he'd lost his left eye. Long time ago, some dirtbag kicked me in the face. No way. Why? They beat up some homeless people for fun, he and his buddy. Honestly, I didn't know what to say. Bet that was the last time they did it, the governor added. How come? They go to jail? Ancient history. The next song on Skink's mix was called Heartbreaker by Led Zeppelin, another band my dad liked. I had my laptop open, doing a little research. Is this right? You were born in? I'm 71. No, 72, I said. You had a birthday two weeks ago. Hmm. Guess I missed the party. 
I asked if he'd really been bitten on the nose by a coral snake, like Jim Tile had told that reporter. It was the toe, not the nose. My friend was being a comedian. Then why aren't you dead from the poison? For three days I wished I was. Jim kept me up and walking so my heart wouldn't stop. I pointed to the rattlesnake rattle on his neck cord. What's the story there? He got hit by a tomato truck on Highway 41. I honor his memory. The governor was a steady driver, a pleasant surprise. I'd assumed it would be hard to steer a car in a straight line if you only had one eye. A few hours out of town, in the middle of nowhere, he slowed down, swung open his door, and snatched a dead crow off the road. Next was an, was an opossum, also deceased, which he grabbed by its hairless pink tail and lobbed into the back seat next to his duffel and the bird. I'm starving, he said. You? I shook my head no, politely. What story you cook up to tell your mom? Nothing yet, I said. Just texted her to say good night. She's visiting my brothers at college. What about Troy? His name's Trent. She's going to strangle him, Skink said. No, I'll tell her it wasn't his fault. It was all me. Okay, your turn. What? I said. The Malibu was slowing down again. See that armadillo up there in the headlights? Yeah, what's left of him. Waste not, want not. Seriously? Perfect angle for a right-hander, said the governor. Just lean out the door and grab the flippin' thing. And don't unhook your seatbelt. Fine. As we rolled by, I reached for the unfortunate creature and whiffed. The car couldn't have been going 10 miles per hour max. Skink chuckled, put it in reverse, and collected the rest of his dinner. 20 minutes later, he turned off onto a, ca a dirt cattle road. I helped him build a small fire, but I couldn't eat any of his roadkill stew. Truthfully, though, it smelled all right. He said freshness was the key, and also the condition of the corpses. Obviously flattened is no good, he said. Unless you're in the mood for pancakes. Show some respect, son. Are we camping out here? No, tonight we drive. If you're tired, sleep in the vehicle. That was all right with me. Every mile we, every mile we traveled was one mile closer to Mally. She had run away five other times. Once it had happened after she got mad at Uncle Dan for confiscating her laptop, but the other four times she'd simply bolted out of boredom. And when I say ran away, my cousin literally ran. Her specialty is cross country, and good luck trying to keep up with that girl. Two nights was the longest she'd ever stayed away, and no boyfriends had been involved, only Mally running solo. After each incident, Sandy would take her to counseling, and naturally, Mally enjoyed making up all kinds of whack stories to mess with the psychologist. One time she had claimed that in a past life she was Cleopatra, Queen of the Nile. Another time she told the counselor that her parents were so mean they made her sleep hanging upside down from the ceiling like a bat. Her worst ever excuse? After she came home last time, Mally told the shrink she'd run away because Justin Bieber was stalking her. She swore he kept climbing the big oak tree outside her house, waving at her adoringly whenever she peeked out the bedroom window. The story was especially outrageous, since my cousin can't stand Justin Bieber. But here's the amazing part. The counselor actually believed that Mally thought she was being stalked and wrote in his report that she was clearly delusional. She couldn't wait to tell me. My cousin is super smart. She aces any class that she wants to ace and blows off the ones that don't hold her attention. But even if, we, even if she were way smarter than the Talbot chalk imposter, it wouldn't help her much if he decided to get rough. Although Mally's almost three inches taller than me, thanks to a major growth spurt, she's thin from all the long distance running. Her arms are like noodles, and I doubted she could punch her way out of a soap bubble. Pray it doesn't come to that, said Skink. I was too wired to nap in the car, so I was telling him more stuff about Mally. She ever had any boyfriends, he asked? Not a boyfriend boyfriend. The guy she ran away with, she met him in a chat room. But you said they met on their computers, this chat room. Is it like a library? Chat rooms are on the computer, I said. Come on, dude, they're virtual. Stop calling me dude or you'll virtually regret it. Why? There's nothing bad about being a dude. Didn't you see the big Lebowski? Skink's good eye turned away from the road and squinted at me. The big what? It's a movie classic. I haven't been to the movie since 1974, he said. In a way, it was like traveling with a space alien. The space alien, a space alien who cussed a lot. I'd been leaving out the bad words, even though they didn't bother me at the time. The man went to war for his country and got shot at, so he could talk however he wanted to talk, as far as I was concerned. Also, he was totally committed to finding my cousin and bringing her home. 
Maybe his friend Jim Tile had told him about the $10,000 reward, but the governor never once mentioned that to me. It seemed unlikely that a person who'd spend his summer chasing turtle egg robbers was interested in money. Are you a fugitive now, I asked, because of what you did to Dodge Olney? Nobody who saw what happened knows who I am. Still, the cops will be hunting for whoever did it. Not very hard, Skink said, considering Olney's rap sheet. He was probably right. Some people would have given him a gold plaque for getting that low life off the beaches. I plugged in my car charger and hooked it to my iPod. Hey, can we play some of my music? Under no circumstances, said Skink. A line of trucks was coming the other way, and their headlights were blinding. I shut my eyes and thought about my cousin. Was she in a motel tonight? A tent? Maybe the back seat of that Toyota? I wondered if she brought any money with her, or if the bogus Talbo Chalk was paying for all their gas and food. Anybody who swiped license tags would have no qualms about stealing a credit card. Maybe he really was a fabulously talented club DJ, like Mally said, or maybe she'd made up that part, too. Evidently, I fell asleep. Next thing I knew, the sun was up and I was alone in the Malibu, which was parked on the bank of a small brackish bay. What had awakened me was the whale song coming from my phone. Hi, Mom, I said. Where are you? On my way to find Mally. Richard, have you lost your freaking mind? She'd already spoken to Blake's father, who had been puzzled to hear about the non-existent camping trip. Don't be mad at Trent, I said. It's 100% my fault. You can come home right now. I can't, Mom. Let the police handle this. No, we've waited long, ago, long enough. Richard, I swear. It's fine, okay? Totally under control. But who are you riding with? Who do you even know that's old enough to drive? Mom, it's... A hand darted hawk-like through the open window and snatched the phone. Mr. Clinton Tyree was now calmly speaking to my mother. Unbelievable. Ma'am, I want to assure you that Richard is safe and well supervised. He and I have set out to find your niece, God willing. I completely appreciate your concerns. Do you have a pen or pencil at hand? I'm going to give you a phone number. The gentleman on the other end will tell you as much about me as he prudently can. He has an outstanding background in law enforcement, so please give him your complete attention. Richard will be in touch with you later. He is a promising young man, as surely you're aware, and he deeply regrets deceiving his stepfather, necessary though it was. Now, here's that phone number. That's when I understood how Skink had gotten elected governor. He was smooth as silk when he chose to be. He said goodbye to my mother and handed me the phone. Where are we? I asked. The wrong damn place. I'm sorry. We drove along the waterfront for maybe half a mile. Then he pulled over in the shade of a concrete span four lanes across. It was tall enough for any tug or deep water fishing boat to pass under. Even a sailboat could make it through. That used to be a drawbridge, he said dejectedly, long time ago. The new bridge arched from the mainland to a barrier island where the shoreline bristled with private docks. Once upon a time, it was all mangroves. On the gulf side of the island was a tourist beach. I only knew that because a small plane was flying back and forth, pulling a banner advertising Happy Hula Hour at some tiki bar. This is where I thought your cousin might be, Skink said. But last time I was here, there weren't any, any high rises. It was a quiet place. To myself, I counted six condo towers lined up like smokestacks. I wonder when they took out the old bridge, Skink said. He was seriously bombed. Hey, we'll just keep looking, I told him. There are plenty of other islands. The old snowbirds who own these condos don't like waiting on a drawbridge. That's why it got torn down. Don't want to miss that early bird special at the macaroni grill. Ha! He kept on muttering like that until I turned up his driving mix again. Then he settled down. I even made him smile by guessing the title of an incredibly old Bob Dylan number called Subterranean Homesick Blues. Skink asked how in the flipping world I knew that one. I explained that my father had loved Dylan and lots of old bands and that the day after Dad died, I downloaded his whole playlist to my iPod. Yeah? Then let's hear it, Skink said. So there we were, rolling down the interstate through downtown Tampa, rocking out to my dad's music. Sometimes, when I'd look over at the governor, I couldn't believe he was 72. Other times, he looked about 110. Now he was like a teenager, shaking a fist and howling the lines in a Pearl Jam song. We had the volume cranked up so loud that I didn't hear my phone ringing. Later, we stopped for lunch at a beachside cafe in Clearwater, where I got to see Skink eat a meal that didn't have to be skinned or plucked. It was then I noticed the voice messages on my cell. 
The first was from Beth, asking where I was and if I'd found Mally yet. The second call was from a blocked number. Sup, Ricardo? Yours truly, checking in. Everything here in paradise is just amazingly awesome. Guess what I saw way up in a tree this morning? An ivory-billed woodpecker. It sounded so lonesome it made me sad. On the message, Mally was coughing and her voice sounded rough. When I played it for Skink, he raised an eyebrow. She calls you Ricardo? First time ever. Weird. She wants you to pay attention. Also, ivory-billed woodpeckers are extinct. I did a project on them for science fair in sixth grade, and Mally helped with the graphics. I know where those birds lived. Live, Skink said. You mean lived. Only one place in Florida, Ricardo, and it's not an island. I know that. The girl's trying to tell you where she's at. And the lonesome part? That means she wants to come home. Correct, he said. Maybe the fake Talbo won't let her go. Assume the worst. That's my motto. With that, the governor got up and strode rapidly toward the car. I crammed the chili dog into my mouth and hustled after him.